welcome the 2022 OFC General Co-Chairs, Shinji Matsuo, David Plant, and Junshan Wei. Welcome. On behalf of the I2P Communication Society, the I2P Photonic Society, Optica, and my fellow co-chairs, I welcome you to OFC 2022, the world premier international event for the latest advances in optical communications and networking. I'm here on stage in San Diego with a live audience. I'm so delighted. Of course, I'm also very happy to see so many friends and colleagues joining us online. The technologies we have been researching and developing are keeping people connected. I'm very proud of this, but we still have a lot of work to do. I believe this OFC is an important milestone moving us forward. This year's program is exciting and dynamic. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and includes highlights of recent progress in, in research and technology. Each year, OFC presents attendees with a comprehensive program, including topical sessions, live demonstrations, unique special events, and celebrations. OFC is a platform for the groundbreaking solution to global challenges driving the industry today. More than ever, OFC is a place to interact with the colleagues and my friends across the world, and to make new connections as we come together as a community. At this OFC, researchers, engineers, technology experts, business leaders, and others will discover, discuss, and debate the latest technological developments in optics and photonics. This is going to be a great week. Thank you, Shinji, and I could not agree more. Uh, it's just lovely to see everybody, and welcome. OFC is proud and excited to share the most recent innovations within our community. During the course of the conference, you will hear and learn about many topics, including advanced digital signal processing for both coherent and direct detection-based transmission systems, the use of machine learning to overcome transmission system impairments, and low latency communications. Additional topics include data center optics moving to the 800G and eventually the 1.6 tera era, enabled by co-packaged optics and electronics targeting pluggable form factors and utilizing high-performance photonic integrated circuits. Other important topics include emerging network architectures in 5G and edge computing, access networks, high-performance and neuromorphic computing, quantum communications, and satellite optical networks. This list, of course, is just a subset of the technical program, and thus we invite you to explore the entirety of the OFC technical program. Finally, and this is really fun, <laughs> we're looking forward to this a great deal, let, remi let me remind you that we will be hosting a conversation with the plenary speaker forum immediately following the close of our plenary session. This event will be held in Theater 3 at 10.15. Thank you, Dave. I am so excited to be here, and a very happy International Women's Day to all of us. Borrowing the words of the Beatles, these last two years have been a long and winding road. But we are back and ready for an incredible week. Yep. One unique... Thank you. Liz. One unique aspect of OFC is that many of this year's hot topics that Dave just discussed can be seen on the exhibit floor by hundreds of global organizations showing their innovations, products, and research. The show floor will also host several educational sessions and inter-op demos, including five leading industry groups showcasing cutting-edge tech technologies from 40 companies. These sessions will provide us insight into hot topics and market trends, the state of industry, and emerging technologies. And we are very proud and very excited to announce the OFC Net. 
It's a game-changing opportunity for the research and education community to participate in OFC. It is just the beginning of an incredible collaboration platform for industry, government, and academia to share discoveries that are driving innovations around the world. Remember to visit OFC Net Booth to find out more. Please, everyone, now let's, let's thank all our exhibitors and sponsors who contributed to making OFC the single most important annual event in optical communications and networking. Be sure to stop by the exhibit hall right after this session. We welcome you again to OFC 2022. Uh, before I introduce our first plenary speaker, the three of us would like to thank the entire OFC 2022 program committee, most especially the technical program chair, Roland Deef, Chris Fletcher, and Dimitri Simon Nidu. They have dedicated an enormous amount of their valuable time to bring you this exclusive program rich in expert insight and real world example. Please join me in a round of applause. Each year, the general chairs select the individuals who inspire us by making great strides in science and technology people who are driving breakthrough innovations for a better future. We are incredibly proud to offer you three outstanding speakers, starting with Professor John Bowers. Professor John Bowers is a Fred Cabri Chair in Nanotechnology, Director of the Institute for Energy Efficiency, and a Distinguished Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Materials at UC Santa Barbara. He has been a leader in semiconductor laser research and development since the 1980s. He and his colleagues have started many companies based on their superior innovations and now provide critical solutions to our community. In particular, in the field of the silicon photonics, Professor Bowers invented the first silicon evanescent laser in 2006 and has achieved many remarkable results since this demonstration. Today, we are very excited to hear from him about the silicon photonics research and the future prospects. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Bowers. Well, thank you, Sinji. And uh, I want to thank Optica and the IEEE for the opportunity to talk to you today. Before we start, I want to acknowledge the tragedy that's going on in Ukraine. And it's, while there's not a lot we can do about it, I think together we can all celebrate the fact that we've built this worldwide fiber optic network that allows instantaneous transmission of information and makes it difficult to hide atrocities as such as we're seeing today. So uh, we need to keep this up. I want to talk about the revolution that is silicon photonics. And before I start, I want to use an analogy. Um, we all remember using film cameras, and this isn't a film camera, but it's my analogy for it. Um, and it, you know, it was dominant until the 90s, and then CMOS came along, and, and the initial CMOS imagers were pretty crappy, and they were not nearly the quality we get with, with uh, film. But now with 3D integration, the cameras that we get in our cell phones are you know, better than a film camera. They work at very low light levels. They have lots of signal processing. And uh, they work remarkably well. Similarly, I'll talk today about silicon photonics and how we've gone from you know, small wafers on indium phosphide to making photonics on silicon. And initially, we tried to make lasers as good as you could do on, on native substrates. But now, as I'll show you today, we can make lasers that are actually dramatically better and, and take advantage of all the wonderful capabilities of silicon, such as extraordinarily low loss waveguides. But there's other advantages. And part of them come from you know, literally upgrading eight generations of processing equipment. Right, The equipment that processes small gallium arsenide indium phosphide wafers 
is poor compared to modern CMOS facilities in terms of their ability to, to make you know, excellent lithography, uh, excellent control, and then scaling, very rapid scaling from a few devices to millions of devices, and that's happening today. So, you know, we can't today, uh, you know, pay for these very modern facilities with just photonics, but rather what's happened is we can use older CMOS facilities, right? So as electronics goes to seven nanometers, there are older fabs that work perfectly well for photonics. With a wavelength of one micron, there isn't really a need for the most advanced electronics, but there is a need for a much more advanced processing capability than existed for smaller wafer sizes. I saw this person, I was privileged to work with Intel as they went from the initial uh, silicon photonics on, on six inch and then eight inch and now 300 millimeter wafers. And this is one of the, uh, this, this wafer is a 100 gigabit transceiver uh, setup and uh, it's, it's now in high volume production. And we used to worry about the fact that you know, you can't put three, five, high gain three, five materials into a CMOS facility, but in fact you can. That's manufactured in a modern facility that primarily does electronics, and that's what pays for it. So today I'll primarily talk about datacom telecom applications, and that's what this conference is about. Uh, and that's the first high volume application, certainly. But just like with other technologies, we can uh, take that, everything that's been developed, and apply it to other applications. And so certainly automotive is, is, is a big new one that's coming. LiDARs exist today. They're really not small enough and cheap enough to be widely deployed yet, but they soon will be. Um, and so many gyroscopes. So all of you who flew here flew in an airplane that had an, a you know, fiber optic gyroscope on it, but it's an exorbitant cost and size, and again, isn't used in automotive a applications. But now with really low loss nitride waveguides, we can integrate that onto a chip with earth rate rotation sensitivity. And so that's, that's exciting. Similarly, with silicon nitride waveguides, we can now go into the visible. So there are now you know, AR, VR applications in particular where we can integrate lasers and modulators and, and all the passive elements that are necessary to make interesting integrated AR, VR devices that are very in inexpensive. Similarly, quantum computing, optical computing, and again, with these narrow line with lasers, we can make lasers, you know, subhertz line widths. We can make a really excellent spectrometer. And that has a lot of applications for, for biosensing. And again, with integration, those can be small and ubiquitous and, and relatively inexpensive. So the point is that silicon photonics is scaling from one to 500 million units now. And that wafer I showed you, this is, this is an example of the of uh, that transceiver, so it's a 100 gigabit CWDM transceiver. And they've shipped, Intel shipped more than 5 million units of it. And you know, it has a modest amount of integration, you know, 50 devices integrated together with one optical fiber coming out. So you gain a lot actually of improved performance and improved yield and, and lower cost. In addition, silicon is not just the the, the waveguide, but it's, it's the substrate. That's what really makes this work, is that we use these modern facilities with, with robust substrates. The waveguide might be silicon SOI, it might be gallium arsenide for nonlinear devices. So CSOI, or compound stomach doctrine insulator, might be silicon nitride, as I just mentioned. So as a result of all of this research by all of us, you know, there's rapid growth in, in papers being presented on silicon photonics. I think last year, over 5,000 papers. Uh, were presented. And at OFC, there's you know, a lot of tutorials, short courses, workshops, and, and it's really exciting to me that you know, companies like Broadcom, you don't think of as giving a tutorial at OFC, but yes, they are, and it is essential to their business. So in the future, we are going to see you know, silicon photonics and photonics now, not just long distance communication, but rather down to the you know, chip to chip. And so the highest performance processors, high bandwidth memory, large switches will all have photonics integrated with it. And that's a very exciting revolution, and that's what I really want to talk about today. So there's lots of companies in the exhibit you'll go to shortly after this uh, that are focused on silicon photonics. The one on the left are you know, primarily, that's their business, 100% of their business. The ones in the center are, are really system companies and, and primarily electronic companies. And uh, a lot of them make silicon photonics now, a lot of them buy silicon photonics these days. 
And on the right, you can see the silicon photonic foundries. And again, there's a large number that have evolved and we can all use to quickly move from initial demonstration to, to high volume production. And that's what's really exciting. And finally, in the lower left, you know, the EDA, the automated design is essential, co-design electronics photonics together to rapidly move to you know, high quality devices. So one of the founders that's out there is AIM Photonics. It's in Albany. It's a 300 millimeter facility. It's very advanced. We're working to integrate lasers onto that platform as part of the uh, LUMOS program. I'll talk more about that. Another good example is Tower Semiconductor, located close to here in, in, in LA. And uh, they have a couple of processes. Uh, 18M, which is used by you know, Nello and uh, Marvel and, and other companies for, for LIDARs and gyroscopes and, and uh, digital production. And then uh, 18D is, uh, Juniper has announced integrating lasers with their process. And, and this Lumos uh, project with Quintessent is, is a, the latest addition to put quantum dots onto that platform. So they really are becoming much more robust and much more useful to all of us. In terms of silicon photonic demonstrations in telecom, a big, a big application here, Acacia was really the world leader, right? They really early on established how you can make very, very high quality, uh, coherent receivers and, uh, and then commercialized that and eventually got bought by Cisco. But again, this high volume, high performance capability is now pushing for not just from long distances down into the data center. So again, data centers, we all know how fast the traffic is growing, how important it is to all of our lives. And uh, that's really the driver for silicon photonics, something that needs very high volumes and, and very rapid scaling from just a few to, to millions. Here's one example. This is Facebook's data center in uh, Singapore. So, you know, it's an 11-story building, you know, 12, uh, 1.8 million square feet. And uh, again, the longer distance you should get in these bigger data centers has pushed this transition from pixels and shorter reach interconnects to the need for now for longer interconnects and the need to be able to transmit either you know, microns to 10 kilometers uh, with the same technology. Of course, AI is, is hugely growing and it's growing much faster than that 25% rate. You can see here you know, a factor of 750x over just two years. And the power required for these you know, training uh, is just you know, at becoming, becoming very large, growing very fast. And, and if we don't improve the power performance, It'll exceed the electricity consumption of everything else in the United States. So a lot of what I'll talk about today is how do we make these things much more power efficient. So this is a projection from Lake, Lake County about silicon photonics. And today the, the red curve is you know, laser modulator and the blue curve is like what I showed there, four channels, you know, modest levels of, of integration. The green is the growth, right? That's something much more complex, much bigger. And uh, that's, that's what I really want to focus on today. The need for these bigger chips is illustrated here. So again, we all know how fast the, the data transition is. You know, we're, we're at you know, uh, a few terabits a few years ago. Now we're at 51 terabits this year. And this switch bandwidth is doubling every two years. And the problem is that electronics doesn't move that fast. right? Electronics is moving at a much slower rate, doubling every four years. And so while the speeds are getting very high, you know, 100 gigahertz or gigabaud, um, the, we need more and more lanes. We need more wavelengths, more fibers in parallel. And that's what's really driving integration of very large numbers of, of photonic devices integrated together. And that's where silicon really ma makes a play. This shows the loss that you get as you try and get off the chips. I mean, copper is very good for very short distances on chip, very dense, very high bandwidth density, very low power. But if you try and go any distance at all, then the loss becomes prohibitive. So, 20 dB losses you know, requires large amounts of amplification and equalization and retiming, and it's kind of a non-starter. So it really drives moving to optics. So we're in this you know, big change now. Where electronics was on silicon, photonics was on any phosphides. You know, Gen 1, we had pluggables at the edge of a circuit board, with these long traces, lots of capacitance, lots of power to, to drive it, to putting the optics closer on board, and then even closer, putting them in the package. And that's what we'll see in so many examples in the trade show today. Um, and again, it's 2.5D, so the, there's a little distance there. The capacitance you have to drive, the power is still not where we need it to be. 
And the ultimate, and, and the picture at the bottom there is Broadcom's example of a co-packaged uh, terabit switch, 51 terabit switch. But the, the next is on the upper right there. So when you actually put the, the electronics and the PIC directly on top of each other, the, the transistors are a few microns away from the, from the optical elements. That's where the real big gain is. There's very little capacitance you have to drive and it becomes extraordinarily efficient. You know, as I say, uh, if you had 50 ohm lines connecting the transistors in a cell phone, it would take 50 megawatts to make a cell phone work. And so the fact that you have all these transistors infinitely integrated and they're all driving just capacitive loads, uh, that's what makes cell phones very low power. And that's how we'll really get the power down in these big switches uh, in the future. And then Gen 4, 5 there listed is the you know, 3D heterogeneously integrated uh, electronics photonics with, with lasers integrated on it. So this chart summarizes this tremendous progress that's going on, right? I mean, just pre-COVID, we were at 100 gigabit transceivers. And now we're 32 times that, right? So 3.2 terabit transceivers. And in fact, in Broadcom's booth, you can see 6.4 terabits. So it's just, just kind of unbelievable. And as we get all this photonics very close to the chip, we have to make it much more efficient. We've gone, again, a 4x improvement in efficiency from 30 picojoules per bit down to just 5 or 6 picojoules per bit. So it's just tremendous progress. And it's going to keep, keep happening. So the line there listed as 6.4 2023 is actually you know, being demonstrated this year. So two years ago, uh, at the time of OFC, Intel made one of the first announcements of co-packaged uh, Ethernet switches, and it's shown here. So it's a you know, uh, one uh, 12 terabit uh, switch with 1.6 terabit interfaces to it. So that you know, that's a, a 40x bandwidth density improvement from what existed before, and that's just you know, just extraordinary progress. We're, we're going to continue to see that happening. This is OIF's leadership in terms of a 30, uh, uh, sorry, 51 terabit switch with 3.2 terabit modules around it. And again, you know, very high levels of, of integration and power management. But now the front panels are very simple, right? There's optical fiber connectors. They're very inexpensive and, and uh, much better than lot, lots of transceivers. So DARPA has been pushing this for a long time. For the last 20 years, they've been pushing silicon photonics and, and solving the problems associated with it. And uh, this is one project, pipes. And uh, what you see here, the metric again, is how high of density can we get times what kind of efficiency can we get? And again, for the short distances on the left-hand side, the your copper works very well. It's very efficient. But as you get further and you get off board, then you lose factors of 10,000 in, in that metric. And uh, so there have been lots of electrical demonstrations of that. And optics works well for longer distances, but it isn't very dense and it isn't very efficient. So the pipes project is to do what's shown here. And it's a, you know, a six order of magnitude increase in bandwidth uh, density efficiency product. And so now the goal of that project is any distance, whether you're going two microns or, or 10 kilometers, you can use the same technology. And that's really exciting. So there are a bunch of teams that are working on this project. Uh, the one that I lead is, is at UCSB. Um, it's together with AIM. The, the silicon photonic chips are made at AIM. And what you can see there in the center of the transmit is there's a whole lot of ring resonators. And so each of those runs at 27 gigabaud. And uh, they're all slightly different in diameter. But with modern CMOS, they actually do all track together and, and uh, the work, work extremely well. So again, here you need now hundreds of devices integrated together to get to a terabit or eventually 10 terabits. And the other aspect that's key here is what's in the lower right, which is, again, bonding the EIC directly to the PIC to get this very, very low power, in this case, half a picojoule per bit. Uh, the other thing which is interesting here is, is the EIC, with all the drivers and, and everything, is actually smaller than the PIC. So again, that's the advantage of going to 7 nanometer uh, eventually, this is not, this is larger than that. This is a slide from Intel that summarizes where we're at and, and, and what the motivation is here. And this isn't a surprise to any of you. It, obviously, electronic chips with you know, now you know, tens of billions of transistors integrated have, are more reliable and they work better because of this high level of integration. And what this shows is, for instance, on the left curve, if you look at you know, four lasers, four lanes, there really isn't a big advantage to discrete versus integrated. However, when you get to where we are even today at 32 lanes, 
there's actually a, a very large improvement in cost and complexity. And on the right-hand side, the, the cost to transmit a bit out of this chip goes down dramatically as you get more levels of integration. And unless you integrate it, it doesn't keep going down, but rather uh, gets worse. So that's really the, the name of the game. So to combine these electronics and photonics together and to get it right the first time, you need very sophisticated tools. And fortunately, there's been a huge advance in that over the last uh, 10 years. And what's shown on the right here are Synopsys' tools. Um, they're similar suites from Cadence and Mentor. But uh, they really have become quite sophisticated and allow you know, co-design of optics and electronics. And that's really essential to moving forward. So I mentioned the PIPES project from DARPA. but They've been supporting a lot of other silicon photonic projects for other things. And I'd like to talk about them because we're going to see this CMOS technology now being applied in, in other areas. So Lumos is integrating lasers on, on, in, in the silicon process. Moab is making uh, sweepers and LIDARs, so you know, optical phase to rays. And in Jim's talk, the third plenary talk, you know, that will become important for long distance optical uh, communication to, to you know, Mars and, and elsewhere. Um, Griffin is making very quiet microwave oscillators, and Dodos is making incredibly quiet optical synthesizers. So here's an example. A lot of these were supported by, by uh, the DARPA MOAB program, but there's been this whole progression of successively more complicated picks that have been made. And the upper right there, you can see the LiDAR chip that Intel has introduced, and uh, hopefully with Mobileye, we'll soon see these being deployed, and, and that will make a significantly safer driving experience for all of us, and I think it will become ubiquitous using the same photonic integration we're using for datacom and telecom today. Similarly, you can make gyroscopes. On the left is the work we've been doing in interferometric gyroscopes. On the right are ring gyroscopes made by Kerry Bahala's group. And again, all the same technologies, low-loss nitride waveguides give you large enclosed areas. The losses are approaching that of optical fiber, and so we can now integrate it on a chip and make it small and inexpensive. And as you can see, we can now achieve earth rate rotation measurement with, with integrated chips. And that's a, that's a big breakthrough. We all know the value of microwave synthesizers and you know, be able to precisely set frequencies for radio and TV and everything else that we do. We can now make optical synthesizers. And what's shown there is taking you know, bigger synthesizers, that you know, self-reference systems that NIST and others have developed, and integrating them and putting them down into a several centimeter package with all the electronics necessary to control it. And on the right, you can see the ability now to, to move lasers in steps of just one hertz. So this is a 200 terahertz laser. We can move it in steps of just one hertz across 65 gigahertz. So, you know, 6, 10 to the 10 steps. And, and that's just an amazing capability. And we'll see this applied to a lot of systems. So I've talked about silicon photonics. And a lot of, they all have lasers, obviously. You need light in it. And there's various ways that that's being done today. You know, one is off-chip lasers that are fiber coupled, and that's very common. And that works for a few lasers. When you start needing hundreds of lasers, as we've talked about, then it really becomes necessary to integrate. The next is hybrid integration, where the two, the laser and the silicon photonic chip are adjacent to each other. And then heterogeneous, like what I showed that wafer from Intel, where you bond the 3.5 material to it, you etch off the substrate, and you process you know, tens of thousands of lasers at one time. And the last is the most advanced is, is monolithic integration, epitaxially growing the materials for high gain on silicon. So again, silicon is an indirect band gap material. It's a very inefficient emitter of light. But 3.5s tend to be very efficient, whether it's in the infrared or in the visible. So here's an example of, of what's in that, that 300 millimeter wafer. Integration of a lot of different technologies, so low loss waveguides. Uh, either silicon nitride or aluminum gallium marcinide or silicon waveguides, isolator materials like YIG, uh, silicon modulators, uh, silicon detectors, and then the right gain region. So again, very high gain, very high quality, typically indium phosphate or gallium arsenide, but now gallium nitride. And we can now use that in the visible for things like AR and VR. So here's one example. This is. Uh, effort that we've had. And you can see here all the bands that we use in you know, the transparent bands of optical fiber. But we can put all of those lasers on one chip, right? And uh, so again, that's much broader than the gain width of any one semiconductor. But by bonding at one time, you know, typically in, in a wafer like that, Intel bonds 5,000 chips at a time, right? And, and you can combine different colors in that. So it could be 
you know, in this case, O to L band, or, uh, but it could be in the visible, blue to red. So you might use nitride materials in the blue and, and galmarstein materials in the red. But you can put them all in the same chip. And so I think, uh, and, and what's shown there in the lower right curve is, is the ability to tune these lasers, you know, over, you know, 50 nanometers with, you know, sub 20 kilohertz resolution. So they're actually very good lasers. Um, our chair, Shinji Matsuo, at NTT, and, and there's been many groups around the world working in this technology, has been integrating lasers with modulators. And he has the world's lowest threshold lasers. So again, by confining the 3.5 material inside a silicon dioxide, you can make a very low threshold laser, literally just a few microamps of, of current. And then you can combine it with high-speed modulators. And again, putting the 3.5 surrounded by SiO2 makes it very uh, efficient. And uh, we're saying the same thing with lithium nanobit. Lithium nanobit and insulator, you can make very efficient, very low voltage, very high speed modulators. Uh, but this is the work going on at NTT. So you might worry about, well, what's the cost of this 3.5 wafer that you use to grow the epi that you bond onto the silicon? And, and it is significant, but you can actually reuse it many times. And that's what the smart cut process is all about. So these two slides from Soitech just show bonding 3.5 on silicon and then with smart cut, you remove the wafer and then you regrow another epi layer. And you can use, reuse the wafer 10 times and reduce the cost of that by a factor of 10. Now, this, these pictures are limited by the size of the 3.5 materials you can get. So the biggest is you know, 150 millimeter. Um, but in general, what's done in that Intel wafer and, and in general in Juniper and other places is to tile lots of devices together. Lot, lots of these together. So you have a handle wafer, you put all the 3.5 materials on there, you bond to the silicon wafer, etch off the substrate, and it's all processed together. And so this is uh, Swoitec's uh, commercial offering in that area. So most of silicon photonics today is based on silicon waveguides, but, and, and they're better than gallium arsenide or any phosphide wafers by about a factor of 10 in loss. But if you go to silicon nitride, then you get really, really low losses. And, you know, approaching, we're not yet at where optical fiber is, but getting closer to it. So the losses might be 0.001 dB per centimeter. And that now starts to open up a lot of other opportunities. So some of them are shown here, you know, time delay, beam forming, quantum photonics, um, or in the nonlinear regime, entering, making, uh, you know, octave bandwidth devices, LIDARs, and so forth. This is the work in Dan Blumenthal's group at UCSB, taking advantage of the fact now that Brillouin gain is very narrow. So you can make a very low noise amplifier, very no low noise laser. You can do it in the infrared as shown on the left or in the visible as shown on the right. And uh, so that's, that's really exciting. You still need a pump laser for Brillouin. And we've been working at integrating uh, pump lasers with the rest of the nitride, and that's shown here. And one big advantage now of making lasers this way is that the Thermal optic coefficient of silicon nitride is very low, so the, these you can make these temperature stable, temperature ins, uh, insensitive, and uh, eventually get, I, I think, obviously much closer spacing of wavelengths. You really don't need CWDM any longer. If you take a, a noisy DFB laser, we all know lasers, semi lasers have you know megahertz line width, and just couple it to one of these high Q resonators the noise drops dramatically. And all that's happening is you just couple the two together. The high Q cavity reduces the spontaneous emission noise. And the bigger you make that cavity, the lower the noise. And on the right-hand side, you can see 70 dB reduction. So we all think of lasers, semi lasers as being noisy. But as the center picture shows, we can now make lasers that are lower noise than you get with fiber lasers or, or many gas lasers. You can make comb generation, single soliton sources, and again, this is the work uh, we've done with Kerry Bahala's group. And you get this turnkey situation of automatically generating uh, single soliton devices. You can integrate it together, again, heterogeneously, lasers and uh, resonators together. So this just sort of summarizes all that. We can get this factor of a million reduction in line width and make millihertz line width lasers now on silicon better than you can with native substrates. So that was all infrared. You can go into the visible. And, and that's what's shown in the blue. So there's lots of applications in the visible AR, VR, and so forth. And Nexus, for instance, is making uh, devices with, again, gain regions integrated with these low-loss waveguides. Today, everything is less than one reticule, but in the future, it's going to be many reticules. And uh, uh, this is an example from Ming Wu's group at Berkeley. So he's now 
integrated 230,000 elements together on silicon, but it's much bigger than one reticule. Fortunately, the stitching loss is very small, 0.01 dB, and so that, that makes it all work. And then for things like quantum circuits, big quantum circuits are going to be more than one reticule, long delay lines, and really quiet gyroscopes will be multiple reticules. So the last thing I just want to briefly touch on is this has all been heterogeneously integrated. We're moving towards monolithic integration. And everything in the past has been either quantum well or quantum dot. But I believe at least at 1310, it, it will be quantum dot based. And the reason is here. A lot of groups around the world have worked on growing materials on silicon. Uh, but the lattice mismatch and the dislocations you get I mean the longest lifetime anyone has gotten is 400 hours. Uh, but with quantum dots, we can get now actually 100 million hours at room temperature lifetimes. And so the, the physics of this dislocation propagation is really interesting, and uh, it really works very, very well. And this shows the six generations of devices, but even at high temperatures now, you can get long lifetimes. So uh, in light of the time here, I'll skip to the end. There is a silicon photonics revolution happening now. Lots of companies are making photonic integrated circuits on silicon in high volume. And uh, uh, I very much want to thank the students in my group for the work that from UCSB and thank DARPA for funding. Thank you very much. Thank you again, John. So your excellent talk. Areas that the heterogeneous technology you developed is a major breakthrough in the field of the silicon photonics. It's like a big bang. So also thank you for sharing your insight in the future of silicon photonics. When 3-5 uh, compound semiconductor can grow freely on silicon substrate, silicon photonics technology can be established in a true way. To sense. At, at that time, silicon photonics technology is expected to be applied not only to communication, but also the sensing and the computing. Thank you. Thank you, Shinji. The success of the optical communications industry is built on the innovations and dedications of so many bright minds. We sadly lost one of the brightest minds last fall. Jane Simmons is one of those who not only made tremendous contributions, but also gave services, outstanding services to the entire community. For, the, for over three decades, Jane played a crucial role in the advancement of all optical networks. During her prolific career, she wrote a widely referenced book on optical network architecture, design, and planning. She taught a popular OFC short course for 15 years in a row. 15 years, isn't that amazing? For the last five years, she was the editor-in-chief of JLCN, and she served on OFC program committees for many, many years. I remember Every time I emailed her with some questions, more often than not, her reply would offer additional insight and point out things that I, I had not thought of. It's a clear trademark of her high standard and her way to inspire others to follow her example. The last time I saw her was here in San Diego for OFC 2020. On the very last evening after the conference ended, Jane, Dave, and I were walking back to the hotel. Jane was still full of energy despite of a long week and was talking about things and topics, improvements that we could add to future OFCs. When she took on the task, she really did give it her all. Even though Jane is no longer with us, her legacy, however, will continue. We are very happy to announce that the OFC leadership has established the Jane M. Simmons Memorial Speakership in her honor. This memorial speakership is endowed by the family of Jane Simmons and her supporters. It is managed by the Aptaka Foundation. 
at each OFC, we will recognize and invite or tutorial speaker who has demonstrated high impact contributions to optical network architecture, design, and planning. This award comes with an honorarium of 3,000 US dollars and a waived OFC registration fee. The winner will also be honored in the OFC awards luncheon. Now, I would like to announce the first winner of Jane M. Simmons Memorial Speakership. The winner is Professor Manya Gobadi. Is Manya here? Please stand up. <laughs> Manya is from the Computer Science and AI Labs. Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT. Professor Gobadi is recognized for her contribution to AI systems and optically interconnected networks utilizing photonic technology in data centers. Congratulations again, Mania. We're looking forward to your talk. And thank you, Jane, for sharing your life and your knowledge with us. You will forever be our inspiration. <clears throat> Thank you, Shen. That was a lovely and fitting tribute to Jane. I now have the privilege of introducing this year's awards recipients from the three co-sponsoring societies. These individuals are recognized for outstanding achievements in their respective fields. These awards and honors will be presented later today during a special awards ceremony luncheon, which is supported by Corning Incorporated. It is my immense pleasure to introduce a short awards presentation. We are honored to have many recipients in the audience today, including two of our general chairs, as well as all of the other uh, award recipients within the audience. So please join me in congratulating all of this year's award recipients, and let me ask all those recipients to please stand and be acknowledged.
Congratulations to you all. I now wish to recognize the winner of the John Tyndall Award, one of the highest honors in our community. The Tyndall Award recognizes outstanding contributions to fiber optics technology. The award is co-sponsored by the IEEE Photonic Society and Optica and supported by Corning. The 2022 recipient of the John Tyndall Award is Professor Mint Smit of the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. Professor Smit is recognized for his leadership in building a photonic integration ecosystem and for pioneering contributions to key photonic devices, including the arrayed waveguide grading. It gives me immense pleasure to congratulate Professor Smit and welcome him via video. I was very lucky that I could uh, join the field of uh, photonic integration in a very early stage. And I could witness its development uh, uh, into a technology which is a great potential for our society. From my experience in radar technology, where I had worked with phased array radars, I thought uh, it must also be possible in optical technology. Well, I got the idea during a sailing vacation, and when I got the idea, I started elaborating it, and well, it took me quite some time, so my wife remembers it still, but not in a positive way. What we published is that uh, in an optical chip you can get coherent interference, that you can do focusing just like you do it in radar technology. In the beginning we didn't realize it, but later on it appeared to be groundbreaking. As you all know, in 1995-1996 things changed a lot. Uh, coherent communication appeared to be too difficult and uh, we moved massively to WDM and at that moment the array waveguide rating, the wavelength demultiplexer was a key component in that technology. In the second stage of the development we focused on integrating more and more components on a single uh, chip. We developed the idea of standardizing the technology in such a way that uh, many users could use the same technology for their application and we call it generic foundry technology. It was a change, a kind of paradigm shift, so no longer changing, uh, optimizing the layer structure, but uh, optimizing the circuits. So start shift thinking from a component level to a circuit level. And now by sharing it, you got for a much lower amount, you get sufficient chips to optimize your design. In the early stages, it's much cheaper, and that makes it also, the threshold for starting with the technology is much lower also for small companies. So since 2005, we have been concentrating on this foundry model, and we did it together with other companies. And in the JAPEX platform, we have been working together to develop the whole infrastructure for designing all kinds of chips for different applications in one single standardized technology. But a very important step in for the future is uh, the integration with electronics. And uh, we're working on that by developing a technology, we call it IMOS, in, in the phosphide membrane on silicon, in which we integrate all photonic functionality that we have now in the generic process. Very thin mem membrane, which uh, we fabricate on top of a silicon wafer. And this silicon wafer can also contain electronics, so in this way we can integrate uh, photonic functionality and electronic functionality in the same wafer. So I'm very happy that now uh, more and more commercial uh, companies are using this technology. It's a very, uh, very nice uh, conclusion of my career that we have brought it so far that it has become uh, sustainable. I'm very grateful uh, to receive this uh, prestigious award and I would like to uh, use the opportunity to thank uh, my colleagues from the Photonic Integrated Circuits Group who uh, did most of the work for which I receive uh, this award now and without them it would have been impossible. And I would also like to thank the colleagues from the JAPEX platform which whom we have collaborated in the past and all the colleagues with which we worked in other projects and who helped making the Foundry approach to a success. Thank you.
Congratulations again, Professor Schmidt. Our next plenary speaker, Elise Neal, is the Senior VP of Verizon New Business Incubation. Her team is the driving force behind Verizon's overall product strategy for Industry 4.0 and 5G future. Their focus is on aerial and terrestrial robotics, industry IoT, and many other emerging technologies. Her team launched the world's first drone with out-of-the-box integrated cellular capability and aviation-grade connectivity. This drone connects directly and seam seamlessly to Verizon's network, so it has access to all the elements for data modeling and mapping, and is managed by Skyward, Verizon's management platform. This is just one example of, of her team's groundbreaking achievements. In addition to running new business incubation, Elise also served as the global lead of the Women's Association of Verizon Employees Resource Group. This group has over 13,000 members in 32 countries. It's, this group is a pivotal advocate for women's advancement at Verizon, providing members with real life skills, work related training, and leadership development opportunities. In the next 30 minutes, Elise will tell us about 5G and the promise of Industry 4.0. Please join me to welcome Elise Neal and her friends. Well, hello. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thanks to the OFC community, there is no better place to be than sunny San Diego. My family and I live in Colorado. In the last I checked, it was about 20 degrees this morning, so I'm feeling like this worked out pretty well for me. My family, maybe not so much, but I am in like no sleeves. This is, this is awesome. Well, today I want to talk to you about how technology is transforming industry and how 5G plays a critical role. But first, perhaps like me, uh, I'm a mother of three children. This last holiday season, you decided that you needed to order your holiday gifts in October for fear that you would not be able to deliver the Mandalorian Lego gift set to your son because maybe then he would realize that like, turns out like toys aren't made in the North Pole or Maybe, like millions of others, you participated in the home improvement revolution as a part of COVID, only to find that your lumber prices had doubled and the time to complete your project had nearly tripled. Or you're welcoming in 2022, the year of like the time that we're gonna be done with the pandemic, you run out to the grocery store, you're ready to drop $100 on a great bottle of champagne, only to realize you have to substitute it for Welch's sparkling grape juice because our friends in France could not get their beautiful bubbles through the Suez. We've all been there, especially over the last two years. And I wanna to talk to you about that kind of challenge space around industry in general, logistics, supply chain, construction, mining, oil and gas, facilities, et cetera. You see, every major industry has gone through a digital transformation already whether it be finance and online banking and instant trading, or maybe it's media and advertising with digital ads and personalization and Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus, or maybe it's transportation as we think about online booking, we think about digital boarding passes, we think about Uber, Lyft, and those like epic electric scooters that pretty much are like a total hazard to society, but really, really fun. Um, or even pharmaceutical. If you think about the pharma industry, I would actually argue that the benefit of technology is part of the reason why we're able to congregate here in person, hopefully, at the tail end of a global pandemic. But there are some industries that have yet to really participate or to experience that digital transformation. We call that Industry 4.0. So I wanna show you a short video to kind of set the stage. Let's roll the video. This is the beginning of a new era. Hundreds of years ago, change took place over the course of a lifetime. But today, 
Technology is transforming our world day by day. The fourth industrial revolution, or Industry 4.0, is a new chapter in human development, enabled by extraordinary technological advances. These advances include new 5G and network capabilities and encompass the digitization and automation of facilities, transportation, and work processes to address the challenges of today and tomorrow, some of which include supply chain disruptions, labor shortages, and inflation. At Verizon, we are enabling our customers to meet the moment of Industry 4.0 and help solve their challenges by digitizing their systems and processes. We are doing this by developing technologies that reduce barriers to adoption by lowering the cost of digital transformation through technologies that enable operators to do more with their existing infrastructure, de-risk change by enabling businesses to simulate and optimize workflows. Automate processes through the orchestration of infrastructure and systems, which today are largely manually programmed and updated, making it difficult to change and adapt in near real time. Introduce autonomy by leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning to process data, analyze outcomes, and automate operations. In just a moment, we're going to share more about the technologies that we are developing to put our customers on the path to digitization and Industry 4.0. First, it's important to understand how the technologies are made possible through the combination of Verizon's various network offerings, mobile edge compute, and intelligent software. All right, it's pretty exciting times here. So I want to talk to you about how we define Industry 4.0. It really has four key characteristics. The first is interconnection, which is the ability to kind of seamlessly operate and interconnect between digital, physical, and biological elements. Then you've got data transparency, high degrees of data transparency so that actually those three elements, biological, physical, uh, and digital, can kind of work together. You have high degrees of technical assistance if any of you have participated in an online proctored COVID test or you think about your AI chatbots. Kind of how do we begin to infuse intelligence into technology to provide those degrees of assistance? And then last but certainly not least is distributed decision making. No longer are all decisions from a compute perspective happening in a singular place, but now we have a variety of options to intelligently choose where the workload needs to happen, in the cloud, in the cloud edge, in the network, in the network edge, on device, et cetera. And while we see new applications and products and services happening in each of these discrete areas, the reality is, is that the promise of Industry 4.0 is actually all of them coming together. It's providing a fully autonomous system that is self-performing, self-healing, self-adapting, and it's matching the appropriate workloads to the right set of processes, all in an autonomous fashion. We get pretty excited about this, uh, but we're not the only ones either. So in a recent study that was launched last year, CGS advisors interviewed over 100 different C-suite executives across the globe in industry 4.0 verticals. So again, construction, oil and gas, mining, supply chain, logistics, et cetera. And they said, hey, how pumped up are you about these technologies? And when you implement them, what do you want them to deliver? Why are you so excited about these new technological innovations? And they came back with great results. They're like, listen, we're going to blow through productivity. We're going to improve workforce safety and, and workplace environment and employee satisfaction. We're also going to materially improve quality processes and quality management. And so we're like, sweet, this is like pretty exciting. However, the same group of individuals were then asked, asked, well, like, where are you at on adoption? How's it going? If you're so excited about the promise of these new technologies, how are they being represented in your new operational practices? Well, less than 10% of them said that they had actually already integrated Industry 4.0 technologies into those operational practices to receive those benefits that we just saw. Instead, about 50% of them were in what we call dabble mode, Right? They're doing proof of concepts, they're kind of doing some ad hoc implementations, maybe you're referencing an R&D budget, and actually a third of them or so hadn't really started. You're still kind of trying to figure out what is the business model, what is the business case, and how do I really get return on the implementation of some of these technologies? So we have to ask ourselves, like there's a disconnect. Clients and customers are really excited, the technologies exist, but implementation isn't really happening at scale. 
Why is that? We see five main customer problem statements that are kind of prohibiting customers from beginning their digitization journey. Those, those things, when you think about the types of industry that we're talking about, first have a wide variety of hardware, whether it's a construction site or a manufacturing plant, and you're partnering with brilliant minds at Siemens or ABB or Rockwell or others, those hardware systems are vertically integrated and not really meant to talk to, frankly, anybody else. The idea of playing nicely with others is not one that has been adopted in these legacy systems. And so when you're thinking about those autonomous designs and that interoperability and the interconnection we talked about, that doesn't really happen. Second, we have legacy and proprietary protocols. The idea that we are going to go to a manufacturing facility and ask them to rip and replace new hardware or applications is frankly a non-starter. I won't ever get invited back to that meeting. So how instead do we think about kind of forward compatible solutions instead? You also have fragmented data sources. Things that live in, in, a, in a CRM system don't talk to a WMS system. We also have individuals who are handwriting still components, not digitized in any way. There's a lot of Excel and there's a lot of steno pads still happening in a lot of these facilities. How do we get that data transparency, not just in that facility, but actually across the end-to-end -end value chain? Then we've got massive data. Once you start connecting, kind of what do I do with it? How do I process it? How do I make sense of it? And how do I maintain the network connection in some of these environments that tend to be quite hostile? They're mixed metals, there's glass, there's a lot of heat, there's a lot of uh, kind of ambient signal components. All of these challenges create, uh, create a new opportunity for us to think differently about how we solve the digitization journey. So. When we think about each of these customers as well, they're talking about not just transforming and needing a flexible working model for their facility or distribution center or their mining operation. Again, they need that transparency across the end-to-end -end value chain. It doesn't really do much good to establish that at a port if kind of the ground logistics and then kind of delivery operations don't also participate right, in the benefit of that digital journey. And really what we're not talking about here is that you know, 4G is good and Wi-Fi is bad or 5G is going to deliver world peace or like satellite connectivity is like only good for rural use cases. That's not what we're talking about. We're actually talking about all of those things working together. What I'm talking about is a vision. It's a blueprint. It's a technological framework. It's also a business model that delivers products and services with optionality that you need for life and for business. We call it network as a service. We believe that it's the technology framework that will define our ability to deliver this kind of go forward economy. The network was built specifically with a distributed edge because we believe that that's the future of network cloud compute. It is a platform for distribution as well as an opportunity for Verizon and others to play above the connectivity layer to deliver those software and solutions in mobile edge compute and in the B2B solutions market. Because our network isn't just automated, it's actually intelligent, and it's intelligently delivered to deliver scale for these highly complex set of use cases. And I'm going to show you a few of them today. But when we think about those five main pain points, those barriers to adoption, and we match that with Verizon's network as a service offerings, the reality is, is like, it's not enough. It's not enough just to have blazing fast network speeds or to be able to connect millions of devices per square kilometer or the ability to deliver crazy low latency, like sub five millisecond latency over the network. Frankly, that's not enough. You need that interoperable software layer and intelligence layer on top. Well, y'all, this is where I get really excited. If you didn't think I was excited yet, like we're stepping it up a notch, so buckle up, like we're going for a ride. So here we go. This is where I get to play, which is in the software space. Several years ago, Verizon began realizing that in order to meet their customers' needs, we needed to start to design a set of software services that would ride and leverage this network as a service infrastructure. Today, we came together and we formed a business unit called New Business Incubation, which I have the pleasure of serving as a part of. And Verizon has begun to invest in six core software businesses that we believe will begin to answer those customer problem statements. I'm going to walk you through them. 
Starting from the left, we have a business unit called Sensor Intelligence. We heard from my colleague about the updates and fascination components around LiDAR and video and fixed and mobile sensors. Well, that comes to life in our Sensor Intelligence business unit, which helps to answer the question for customers, what is happening in a space? I'm counting things, I'm doing motion analytics, I'm measuring components, I'm starting to kind of put those elements together. So Sensor Intelligence, that business unit, helps to answer what is happening. Once you've got that in play, you then want to answer, where is it happening? That's our location orientation as we think about the creation and dynamic updating of digital twins and our simulation engines and precise positioning. So you've got what is happening, and then you have where is it happening and what will happen next. But then you have to think about how is it going to happen? What, how, do, how do we actually take these components and put them into action? What are those workforce loads? Here we have our aerial robotics, our fixed robotics, and some of my new friends, our ground robotics. As we think about these elements kind of coming to life, it is the ability for us to interoperate each of those components together. It's to take what's in the air and what's on the ground and what is fixed and what is mobile and to allow them to work together. Now, in addition to that, I'll close with our last business unit, which is our energy management platform. So we are answering what is happening, where is happening, how is it happening, and then how do I manage that intelligently using distributed energy resources, wind, water, solar, battery, and balance that against the energy grid. We have a ton of fun at Verizon in these business units. These things are just wicked, like they're super cool. So let me talk to you a little bit about my friends here. As we think about these elements, um, I want to not talk too bad about my friends, but the reality is, is like, these guys are pretty high needs. <laughs> uh, they're quite demanding friends. As we think about these elements, they're really similar to children. These robots, when you pull them out of a box, they really don't know anything about their world, and you have to teach them everything. You need to teach them how to run, how to walk, how to get from point A to point B. You have to tell them where they are. You have to give them boundaries. You also have to tell them how to play nice with others. No spitting, no kicking, no swearing, right? Like we got They're literally just like children. And you also have to tell them when to relax, when to take a nap, and where and when to recharge those batteries. We believe that robots can be used for a wide variety of tasks, whether they have legs or wheels or wings or arms, but most of them were built with singularity in mind today. They're, they were built for a specific purpose. We actually see a world where one robot can perform a wide variety of autonomous tasks, but that's, again, not really how they were designed, generally speaking, today. You see, robots need a window into the world, and you can actually see some of the censoring on the component part. It actually looks like eyes and a mouth, but it's not, I promise you. But these are stereo and LiDAR-based cameras that allow them to see and to constantly ask the question, where am I, where am I, where am I, where am I? And where are you, where are you, what is that, what is the world around me? So they need kind of context and positioning in that space. And today that is equipped using heavy sensors and expensive cameras and all of those components kind of put together with compute and processing on board the device itself. We're basically giving it everything it needs to know on the actual, it's like a brain on the device. We believe and are starting to begin to test what happens if you actually remove those expensive sensors and put a webcam on it? What happens if you actually thin out the actual device itself. If you move, remove compute and processing and put it into the network and into mobile edge compute, is it possible then that we can begin to start to see reduced battery drain because you're removing weight from the actual device itself? We now have the ability through software to create interoperability. And in addition to that, we are now beginning to see that we can actually reduce the bill of materials on the device by removing some of those censoring components and putting into the network. And the reality is, is like all of that is amazing. However, some of the next generation advancements that we're doing is really around reinforcement learning. So again, going back to the child analogy, any of you who have young children, you know that age old adage of the child kind of touching the stove for the first time. And because of the reinforcement learning that pain is not good, that now they will never touch the stove again, in theory. A robot is the exact same thing. 
Every time it comes to a task that it doesn't know how to intelligently decide around, a software engineer is required to create a new AI library and deploy it to the machine to allow them to kind of uh, create object detection, recognition, and avoidance for each of those elements. Now, every time they do that for one robot, they need to do it for every other form factor, and it's different every time they do it. It is totally unscalable. We see an opportunity, however, to apply reinforcement learning so that actually one robot can intelligently decision around one particular obstacle, and that that intelligence is then downloaded and streamed using the network and mobile edge compute to every other device in an instant. Now what you have is this reinforcement model using AGI and the network in order to create faster times to return on investment. These guys are expensive. We need to figure out a way to increase that adoption by reducing the cost, by creating scale, and allowing that interoperability that we talked about before on the challenge statement. OK, do you guys want to see something in action? Do you want to see how this all comes together? I've choreographed a dance. I'm just kidding. I haven't. But you've all seen them online, which is fantastic. All right, we're going to take to a demo. So let me tee this up as it pops on the screen here. So uh, I want to talk to you about how all of these elements are coming together. What you're going to see in this video is several elements. First, what we have is a perimeter security use case. We have a building where there has been a vehicle that has been parked for more than 24 hours, indicating a security risk. Now, today what you see is our sensor intelligence video camera notifies that there is a parked vehicle that is there. It automatically deploys our mission control for our ground robot, which doesn't know what is on the ground. As it begins to survey the infrastructure, it's trying to understand what is this thing. You'll see it build the digital twin in real time and reference through the network our ability to understand that this is, in fact, a Toyota Tacoma truck. In addition to that, it also is an inspection criteria. So it's trying to figure out what are the inspection elements that need to happen in real time. You'll see the dots appear, which tells it it needs to look inside the carriage, it needs to look underneath the carriage, and it needs to look in the bed of the truck. Now, what is the robot looking for? It's looking for an individual who needs help. It's looking for an individual who decided to take residence in their car that night. It's looking for nefarious behavior or any other kind of, kind of hazardous item. And as it does it, it's using its cameras, always streaming back to the team that is kind of analyzing those components and recording those elements in real time. And it's beginning to kind of understand these components. In the bed of the truck, it sees that there's an additional vehicle here, and it automatically streams through reinforcement learning the FLIR detection to determine whether or not this is a safe package or not. Thankfully, all is clear. It completes its mission, and it dynamically goes back to its home. Now, what you see here is a combination of elements. You have Verizon's 5G network, our mobile edge compute for low latency. You have our software businesses around sensor intelligence, our robotic mission planning software, our digital twin components, and our dynamically streaming AI libraries that help to interpret the what and the where and the how of this end-to-end -end autonomous operation. Typically, what would happen is a very, like, a uh, strong and brave individual would walk out with a steno pad, would take some notes, would risk potentially their life and other dangerous elements to go try to inspect a vehicle, return back home and write it down on a pad and say everything is good to go. We believe there's a better, a better way to do that, a safer way to do that, a more efficient way to do that. So as I close my time here today, I want to invite you into this journey with Verizon. So we are working to shape the 5G future and the 5G economy, and we want to invite you to come along with us. As we do that, we have our experience down on the exhibit floor that showcases these use cases as well as a variety of others in our software capabilities. And we would love to have the team kind of spend time with you and talk you through those, those elements. So with that, thank you so much for the opportunity. We will see you soon. <clears throat> Thank you, Elise, for sharing with us your vision of the applications of 5G. Uh, the future is indeed bright. This fellow's in good shape. This fellow might need a little work later on, but uh, in the meantime, if they need to be taken out for dinner, I would love to take your friends out for dinner later tonight. Okay, on to our next plenary talk. Uh, our next plenary talk is... 
There we go. Our next plenary talk is from one of the world's foremost visionaries on the age of human and robotic space exploration. Please welcome Dr. Jim Green, former chief scientist of NASA and currently serving the agency as scientist and senior advisor. Jim advises the NASA administrator and other senior officials on agency science programs, strategic planning, science policy, and the evaluation of related investments. Prior to his appointment as, as chief scientist, Dr. Green was the director of the Planetary Science Division at NASA headquarters, a position he held from 2006 to 2018. Under his leadership, he managed the New Horizons space, spacecraft flyby of Pluto, the Juno spacecraft to Jupiter, and the landing of the Curiosity rover on Mars, just to name a few. Dr. Green was awarded Japan's Kotani Prize in recognition of his international science data management activities, and he later received the NASA Exceptional Achievement Medal for the New Horizons flyby of the Pluto system. Furthermore, in 2015, Jim helped coordinate the NASA involvement with the film The Martian. Please welcome Dr. Jim Green. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. Well, it's really a delight to be here at OFC, and I want to take this opportunity to talk about the fantastic things that NASA is doing. So come along with me on a journey into space as we go to the moon and then on to Mars. And what we want to do is talk about how we do these things, the observations that we make, with our rovers, our landers, and our orbiters, but also how we communicate that, how we communicate the science, both in bits, but also in the excitement and the activities that we do. Well, let me start out first with a little history. Our communication in NASA, of course, is really starts with radio frequencies. So in the early 60s, we were at only 960 megahertz, you know, and as we all know, uh, the higher the frequency, uh, the more data and the better it can be. Soon after that, by the late 60s, we were using uh, S-band. And then in the 70s, we went to X-band. And then KA-band is now becoming much more the standard today. But I'm here to tell you, we're on the verge of moving to optical communication in major ways. And I want to point out some of those features or capabilities we absolutely have to have. The technologies that you're developing today, we want to be able to implement them. So I want to give you a roadmap of what we're doing at the moon and then on to Mars that you then can see how you can fit in to help us be successful in moving beyond low Earth orbit and have humans walking on the surface of the, of the moon and then indeed on to Mars. Now, currently, our radio frequency communication is out of three major locations for deep space communication. It's at uh, uh, California, at Goldstone. Uh, we also have a major station in Madrid and another major station in Australia. And of course, then, as you can see, these three enable us to cover uh, the solar system always having a set of antennas pointing outward as to wherever our missions are, whether they're going to Mercury or they're flying out well past Pluto or even leaving the solar system, tasting the winds of other stars as the Voyagers are currently doing. Also, let me start uh, talking about some of our communication technologies by beginning with the Apollo program. Uh, of course, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, we had six major missions land, humans that worked on the surface. Now, granted, they were only there for a few days, and they deployed a variety of instruments, but they were tremendously successful. We brought back more than 850 pounds of lunar material. These rocks were so important. They told us the age of the moon. And the age of the moon was 4.5 billion years. Rocks here on Earth, when we got them and look at them and see how old the Earth is, based on that material, was only about 3.8 billion years. 
Why the difference? Did we acquire the moon after it was made? And the answer is no. Because of our plate tectonics and our weathering and the ability for our crust to overturn, the oldest rocks on earth are gone because the moon and the earth were made together at the early part of our solar system. The astounding thing that we found really began with Neil Armstrong putting out on the surface of the moon a retro reflector. It's a crude box of reflectors uh, two feet by two feet or so that he just oriented towards the earth and that was it. It's a very passive experiment but we use a laser to bounce light off that and we time it up and back. That tells us the distance to the moon. We've been doing this now for 50 years. Each and every year we go do that. Now why is that? Didn't we get it right the first time? Well, the answer is, surprisingly, the moon is moving away from the earth an inch and a half a year, and we measure it. This is really important for us to understand the dynamics of the earth and the moon. The moon is incredibly important. It stabilizes our axis, where our axis at uh, is 23 and a half degrees, but it can be as high as 24 and a half can be as low as 22 degrees. And that stability allows us to have major stable climate periods. The moon also, uh, when it was formed, was enormous. It turns out, if we back up into time, go back 4.5 billion years, when the moon was created, it was inside of geosynchronous orbit. It dominated the sky. It was 20 times larger than it is today. It was an unbelievable sight if you actually could walk on the surface of the Earth and look up during that time period. Well, this is an amazing set of observations, but we've extended that since the Apollo. What we've done is had a major set of orbiters that have really interrogated the moon from all aspects of it, and we've made a series of other astounding observations of the moon. And it begins by looking in the polar caps, not in the areas that we originally landed, which were in the area of the middle of the moon on the near side where we could always see our astronauts, but because of our orbiters and looking down, what we're finding out is the polar caps are incredibly cold. Now, in this animation of one month of lunar observations, we have colored areas of the moon that are incredibly cold. These are permanently shadowed regions. These areas never receive sunlight. Now, here is an example of uh, this area. Uh, over one month's worth of observations, and you can see the dark areas. These dark areas are incredibly cold. But from our orbiters, we've been able to peer into these craters and get an understanding that there are more water in these craters than we ever imagined. Yes, frozen water is in these permanently trapped regions. How did it get there? This coloring of the blue indicates a concentration of hydrogen that's locked with oxygen, allowing us to really get an estimate of the amount of water that's in these permanently shadowed regions. And in the South Pole and the North Pole, the sum of the water is several hundred million tons. And that actually may be an underestimate. Well, why is water so important? We couldn't find it with the Apollo missions, but here's a reservoir of an important set of material that we can use. We don't have to take all the water with us to the moon. But water is H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. We can drink it. Water is water, whether it's here on Earth or on the moon. It's still H2O. We can tease it apart and we can use the oxygen to breathe. We can tease it apart and the hydrogen and oxygen can be used to develop rocket fuel. But because we know the moon was so close to the earth at the time of its origin, we've also modeled that in our computers and we've recognized there's far more material than just water in these permanently shadowed regions. 
There'll be carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. There'll be sulfur. There'll be a whole array of volatiles that we can't measure from orbit, but we can use those as we learn to live and work on a planetary surface by going to the South Pole. This is a very important resource for us. Now, also, in addition to the water and these volatiles that are there, we also find that there are magnetic anomalies in and around the South Pole. These magnetic anomalies tell us that there's a significant amount of, of metals, iron, nickel, but also the platinum group metals. Platinum group metals are so critical for us. Of course, the platinum group metals in our phones and all our electronic equipment is important to conduct electricity, but they don't rust. Enables us to have this explosion of our electronics. But of course, we're mining these areas out and without reclamation and, and uh, recycling, uh, then the next, set of uh, the next set of wonderful resources in this particular area turns out to be the moon. Now, this is really exciting because what we want to be able to do is send a series of missions to really understand this polar region. Most of our missions have been orbiters up to this stage to look at the South Pole and the North Pole, but now we're entering an era of rapid acceleration of our landers. And in the next several years, we're going to have nearly a dozen landers, many of which will go to the South Pole and really tease out many of the things that we will have there as resources that we want to be able to use, get us a better understanding of the amount of water, the amount of volatiles. This is going to be critically important. Uh, in fact, in this next year, half of these missions will be launched. This is an exciting time for us as we learn how we can use these resources for human exploration. In the next couple months, we're going to launch the first Artemis mission. It's right now being constructed at uh, the Kennedy Space Center in their very large uh, uh, vertical assembly building. Uh, it has a, a capsule that can house uh, up to six crewmen. It's called the Orion capsule, and this is, of course, the space launch system. Now, the SLS is going to be used in a series of these human missions to the moon. It's also capable to go onwards towards Mars, which is one of the reasons why we need a rocket of this capability. It is 10% more capable than the Saturn V. Now, many perhaps haven't seen a Saturn V launch since uh, uh, you're a lot younger than that, but indeed, it shook the Earth three miles away. And so these are enormous capabilities with enormous lift that can bring supplies up to the moon and then, of course, on to Mars. Now, as I mentioned, the first Artemis mission is coming up this year. It's being uh, put together right now. But in addition to that, we're going to follow that on with Artemis II and then Artemis III. And the scenario goes like this. The first Artemis mission will be uncrewed. It will go out, do a figure eight around the moon, and then return. What we'll learn from that will feed into the next Artemis mission, which will be crewed. And that mission then will be launched and go uh, figure eight around the moon and come back. That gets us ready for the third Artemis mission. Now, we're going to continue to have a series of orbiters in addition to those landers I talked about earlier. Those will be orbiting the moon that will pro be providing additional information, but one in particular is on the right side of this image. It's called the Gateway. The Gateway actually is a mini space station that will be constructed. And it will be where we dock and then we'll go down to the surface. It will also house our next big step in laser communication back to Earth. Human expl exploration into the solar system is going to require as much data as we possibly can get but also it has to support video, it has to support audio. And those together require laser communication. So where on the moon will the Artemis astronauts actually step down? 
We will in the next couple of years then have the first woman and the next man step in one of these boxes. We haven't decided where yet. We'll make that announcement as we continue on the analysis of going to uh, this wonderful site that will then begin a process of exploring. We'll then do resource, resource utilization by extracting the water. We'll then begin the process of of traveling around, prospecting, looking at the resources, as I mentioned, which are the magnetic anomalies that we've also seen from orbit. This is going to be an incredibly exciting time for us. But of course, it gives us the opportunity to learn to live and work on a planetary surface because we'll go from the moon, indeed, to Mars next. It gives us the opportunities to use the resources that are there figure out how to use the regolith in our 3D prints to create either parts or pieces or actually panels that can go into habitats. We will have to grow food there. The Artemis mission is designed, these next three, to launch us into another series of missions for which humans will stay on the surface of the moon for longer and longer periods of time. Unlike the Apollo program for which we landed and in a day or two we then returned. We're going to plan to stay on the moon for weeks, perhaps more than a month. Uh, but we have to understand what the resources that are available. This is a tremendous opportunity for us to move from low Earth orbit out into the solar system. Now, of course, as I mentioned, the next step beyond the moon is Mars. Mars is a beautiful planet and in fact it was created out of the same material that the earth and, and the moon was created in our collapsing nebula about 4.5 billion years ago. Uh, we have as a world launched more than 55 missions to the red planet but only half of them, about half of them, have actually worked and been successful. Why is that? Well, Mars is hard, and it's been hard to get to. We've missed the planet. We've crashed on the planet. We've gotten in the orbit, and then the spacecraft dies. We've done everything you can possibly imagine, but now we've gotten the rhythm. We really understand how we can get to Mars to begin the process of exploring it, understanding it, and be ready for human exploration, which will be that next big huge step. This overview of the history of Mars is what we have put together from the last 55 or so years of exploration. We realize that when Mars was created, at the same time the Earth was, it was a blue planet. It was a blue planet. It had an enormous amount of water. Two-thirds of the northern hemisphere was underwater, and in some places, more than a mile. And it stayed that way for hundreds of millions of years. Perhaps a billion years, water flowed on this planet. But Mars lost its magnetic field. The oceans began to evaporate, and that cycle of evaporation, transport, and rain became broken. And we lost the rain, we lost the replenishment of that water, and the solar wind continued to strip away the atmosphere of the planet. It then became an arid planet, the desert planet that we see today. So by going and exploring Mars today, we're actually going back in time to see what the early Mars looked like, where the climate change occurred. And why did that happen? What were the processes? Did it happen over tens of millions of years or did it happen over a hundred million years? When Earth life started 3.8 billion years ago, Mars was a blue planet. This brings up the question of, well, did life start on Mars too, like it did here on Earth? These are the questions we want to answer. And we do that today with the wonderful armada of missions that this world has contributed to orbiters, landers, and rovers on the surface of Mars today. This, this set is what is currently operating at Mars. These 
are contributions from a series of nations. In addition to NASA, there's the European Space Agency, the Russian Space Agency, the Chinese Space Agency, India has an orbiter, and the UAE has an orbiter. This is a fabulous array of missions that are, are really teasing out and answering some of the questions that we have about Mars, how it evolves, and what it looks like today, and how did it get that way. On the surface of Mars, the Curiosity rover has lasted more than 10 years, and it's incredibly great health. Since it landed in 2012, it has explored Gale Crater. This is a crater that sits on the ancient shoreline of Mars, and it has been grounding up the rock and the soils and bringing it into the rover. It's designed to get the elemental composition of the land. And what we're finding out is that Mars has carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, all the materials that make up a human being that are between my two fingers are the composition of the soils on Mars. The soils also have nitrates, great fertilizer, in addition to them being moist. So can Mark Watney really grow potatoes? And the answer is, yeah, we think he can because we're planning to do the same thing. Now, in addition to Curiosity, we have the InSight lander. Landed uh, a couple years ago in 2018, and in that length of time, it has measured more than 800 seismic events. These seismic events are from uh, Mars quakes. They're perhaps from impacts of meteorites hitting the planet. They're perhaps from tugs and pulls by Jupiter that are messing with Mars. We're teasing out the whole range of seismic events that we're seeing on Mars, but one thing is clear. We're able to get an understanding of the interior of the planet. It has a core, a mantle, and a crust. A number of surprises have come out. The core has a liquid portion, a liquid outer portion. Now, Mars is much smaller than the Earth, and our thinking was that perhaps because it lost its magnetic field perhaps three billion years ago, when the climate started to change, and the atmosphere was being stripped by the solar wind, that maybe because of its small size, that meant the core is now solidified. Turns out that's not the case. Mars's crust has really kept the heat intact. It doesn't have plate tectonics that releases the heat in the interior of the planet the way the Earth does. Although there's been a lot of volcanic activity, and we can see the results of the huge shield volcanoes all over the planet. But indeed, that heat can be used, perhaps, by humans going there, living and working and exploring Mars, heating the habitats that it has. And then, of course, we have landed most recently, in February of last year, the Perseverance rover. The Perseverance rover is designed to core rock. It has a cylindrical drill that drills into rock, breaks off the core, and then that rock is like a piece of chalkboard chalk. And in looking at the audience, perhaps, that uh, uh, never went to a chalkboard to write their name or put on an equation, let me mention that it's like the size of a large Crayola cram. All right, now these cores are going to be sleeved. They're going to be laid on the surface, and then future missions will come and pick those up and bring them back to the Earth. So we have a fabulous array of operating missions. Well, how do they communicate? I've talked about some of the science, but we've got to get that data back. These orbiters are all pretty low altitude, up to perhaps 450 kilometers altitude orbiting Mars, and they communicate back to Earth in X-band, all right? Well, how do the surface assets, the rovers and the landers, how do they communicate? They don't have big dishes that they tow behind them they actually communicate to the orbiters. And they communicate to the orbiters in UHF, all right? Now this allows us to get only so much data off the surface because 
the orbiters are performing a dual function. Not only are they making their own observations, but they're actually communication relay systems. And so consequently, we get about 500 megabits uh, per Mars day off the planet. Our rovers and, and uh, landers generate far more data than we actually can get off the planet. This means we've got to be able to change our frequency and move into the optical communication era. This architecture, although has served us well for many decades, is going to have to change. We're going to have to leave low Earth orbit and actually have some dedicated communication satellites at aerostationary orbit, you know, like our geosynchronous orbits that we have today. Well, if we take a look at Perseverance, it actually has a couple communication capabilities. The UHF is a helical and coiled antenna that sits behind the rover, but it actually has an X-band system that can, in emergencies, communicate back to Earth, but only at a piddly 500 bits per second. So it's not used, but only as a backup and, of course, as an extreme if there are problems with the orbiters or we miss certain passes and we have to understand why that occurred, we can get access to the rover direct from Earth. And of course, here's an example of what the samples look like in the sample tubes that we seal them in. So this is about a 15 gram set of sample, uh, and we have 43 sample tubes. And we're going to fill those samples based on where we go. And we've decided, and the rover's there now, to go to Yezero Crater. Yezero Crater, if I can take you back in time 3.8 billion years ago, this is at a time when Mars was a blue planet and life started on Earth, a huge impact occurred right on the ancient shoreline of Mars, creating Yezero Crater, all right? Now what was happening in the upper left is a river flowed into the ancient ocean and now it flowed into Yezero Crater and it filled the crater up, but then that ocean weight pushed out uh, the, uh, the crater wall on the north side, having that water access that ancient ocean. And what is deposited at the bottom of that river as that rapidly flowing well, water flowed into the crater, of course, uh, and the crater water was relatively still, created a delta. If we could drain the Gulf of Mexico and stop the Mississippi, that's what it would look like at Yezero Crater, and that's where we are sitting today. In these deltas are an enormous cache, we believe, of information. Perhaps we can answer that question, was there life on the planet? Uh, in, in our deltas here on Earth, that our ancient deltas with dried up river beds, we see clearly signs of life in the river and in the water. How did we land? Well, we landed in a very complicated way. What we had to do because the Mars atmosphere is only about a percent of our own atmosphere is through this process we call entry, descent, and landing. Entry requires a, a, a heat shield on our capsule capsule has the rover tucked inside it. It hits the top of the atmosphere going about 13,000 miles per hour. And in seven minutes, it has to go inches per second as it sits safely down on the surface. And it does that in this manner. Heat shield slows it down. Drop the heat shield, pop a chute, slows it even further. Uh, get about uh, 100 feet off the surface and drop the rover to the ground. Now on top of the rover is a retro rocket system we call the sky crane. The sky crane then takes the rover to the surface. We also have the ability to analyze the images that it's taking and move it around such that it can land it in a safe location, which it did in this case. That sky crane then hovers it hovers at about 50 feet above the ground and then lowers the rover down to the surface. And as it lowers the rover down to the surface and gets the registration that it has landed safely, the lines are broken 
and the sky crane flies away and crashes. And then we have a rover on the surface of Mars. Here's a fabulous high resolution image from one of our orbiters called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. This particular orbiter is mapping Mars at high resolution. If that table sat on the surface of Mars, we could see it from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, all right? And it's been in orbit since about 2006. And even in that length of time, it has only created 4% of the surface images at that high resolution. Mars is a big place. It's a huge planet in reality. Here, this remarkable picture is a perseverance in the phase of descent where the chute is deployed. The circle in the center of the image is where it will eventually land. Now, here is where, from the sky crane point of view, the rover is lowered down to the surface, and you can see the delta. We're just outside the delta. And the delta is about 65 meters tall of material that's built up over tens of billion, millions of years as this rapid water hit the slow moving water in the crater. And then on the surface it has these beautiful vistas of the upcoming delta as we see. Now we've been on the surface for about a year and we've made six samples. One atmospheric sample, but also uh, six or, uh, sorry, seven samples, one atmospheric sample, and six rock samples, all right, down in the crater floor. Uh, this is a beautiful place. We want to understand what that floor is all about. We actually see a lot of basaltic rock. This is, this is lava. This is material that's been melted, rock that's been melted, and then thrown either into the crater or has come down uh, from, the, from the spillway, from the rapidly flowing water into this area. The rock samples are incredibly important. The history of the planet is, of course, like here on Earth, in the geology, in the rock record. And in that rock record, we hope to be able to answer several questions. What about the rapid climate change? How did it happen? When did it happen? How long did it take to do that? Climate change is an important topic today, and comparing what happens on other planets are important. What happens on Venus could happen on Earth. What's happened on Mars could happen on Earth. And these are the things that we do in planetary science to understand the evolution of our own planet. In addition to that, the rock record could tell us perhaps if there was life in the past. We have more than 5,000 minerals here on Earth. But about 350 of those minerals can only be made by dead life. And by that rock record, we're going to understand if life came and went on the planet based on where we take these samples. Now, we're going to bring them back. We bring them back in a series of missions. Uh, the first mission, M1, uh, will be launched in a couple years. It contains a rocket and a rover. The rover will pick up the samples that are laid on the surface in these encased uh, metal sleeves and then bring them to the rocket. They will load the rocket and the rocket will be erected and this Mars Ascent vehicle, this MAV, then will be launched into orbit leaving the samples in a container that will be picked up by the second mission that will get into orbit, hunt down these samples, grab these samples, and bring them back to Earth, dropping them off in the desert in Utah for then us to bring them into a biosafety level four facility, interrogate them to ensure that there's no pathogens that we brought back, but then releasing them eventually into the scientific community for further study to answer those fabulous questions that we want to know. Now, in addition, to uh, these fabulous samples that we will acquire. Uh, we also, on Perseverance, had a technology demonstration mission. It was a helicopter. And that helicopter, whose name is Ingenuity, was underneath the belly pan of the rover. We dropped the belly pan and then deployed two legs, deployed the other two legs, dropping the helicopter off and driving away 
We went about 50 meters away, and then we turned the helicopter on to make its first flights uh, on the surface. So how do we communicate back and forth with the helicopter? Well, it turns out we do it at fairly low frequency, 914 megahertz, FM, antenna, receiver, and transmitter. It's a little bitty antenna that sits on top of the, of, of the helicopter, and it, it, we have another antenna on, of course, uh, the rover, and that's how they communicate. We can communicate up to a kilometer in distance. And so this helicopter, when we turned it on, it only worked in a vacuum chamber. This is the first successful flying machine on another planet. And it's been a tremendous success. So we went through five flights. And here is the third flight. This was a, a motion of the helicopter up to about 20 or 25 feet, and then a translation. Each of these flights are several minutes long, longer than the Wright brothers' first flights and then we translated back and then landed exactly where we took off. The helicopter is only four pounds. It has uh, two GoPro cameras, one looking straight out, one looking straight down. It has an altimeter in it, and it has worked perfectly. It's now just finished its 20th flight. The first five checkout flights were so successful, we now use this helicopter to tour the area to determine perhaps some important pathways, not only for the rover to go, but for the rover to avoid. And here is a, a fabulous downward look from the rover, sorry, from the helicopter itself in this path of the 10th flight. And as you can see how perfectly it worked, making the turns, hovering, and then finding a new landing site. It has a, a uh, fabulous capability of onboard image processing. And then, of course, at the end of that flight, it radios back to Perseverance all the data that it has taken. What a, what a fabulous set of observations that it has made. So finally, let me go back. So finally, let me end by mentioning optical communication is our next big step. We have uh, the LCRD, uh, the LRCD, rather, in, in geosynchronous orbit right now, communicating back to Earth, laser communication. We also are installing something on the International Space Station to then also relay. Those relay purposes are important for us, as I mentioned, in the architecture at Mars. We'll also have the gateway capability. And indeed, we're going to use KA band along with uh, optical communication from the moon down to Earth and back. As we move towards deep space, we actually have a spacecraft called Psyche on the way out to the asteroid belt. It's going to a metal asteroid by the name of Psyche. It has an optical comm testing system. It's a photon counting system that then will do a gravity assist by Mars, but test the optical communication link from here to Mars. These are indeed are just the start of optical communication that we must do to support humans uh, living and working on the moon and then going to the red planet. We need your innovations. We need your knowledge. And these systems that we want to implement will allow us to bring back high speed, huge amounts of video, audio, and data. It's our future. And thank you for your work in this area. Thank you, Jim. The work that you and your colleagues are doing at NASA is truly inspiring. And I just have to add one quick comment. I want to acknowledge Doug and his excellent performance last night at the chair's reception. <laughs> Okay. It was a great pleasure to bring you these three incredible speakers. Thank you, John, Eris, and Jim, for sharing your vision with us today. If you have any questions for them, I know I do. We have a chance to meet with them in the special conversation with the plenary speaker session in the exhibit hall, Theater 3, 1015. 
The exhibit hall is now open, whether you are in San Diego or online. We look forward to seeing you throughout the week. Thank you again, everyone. Enjoy OFC.